welcome my next guest. Guest, um, as you just heard, please give a very warm welcome to Mala, who has taken off her presenter hat and put her speaker hat on. Uh, you don't have any glasses to put on, like Trisha does, but we do appreciate you doing this context switch for us. So, are you looking forward to your talk, Mala? Absolutely, Helen. Absolutely. Good. We're, we're certainly looking forward to hearing it. Um, so I don't think Mala needs a particularly long introduction, but I will I will give the spiel. Um, so Mala's going to be talking to us today uh, around the fact that JetBrains are releasing Intelligy Idea three times a year. You've got Java's six monthly release cycle as well. Um, and the IDE excels at keeping up to date with these new language features and um, being uh, very, very cutting edge. Um, for the Java releases. So Mala's going to show us how this release cadence and the other IntelliJ IDEA features can help us to keep pace with the new Java versions, which like we were just talking about, it's much faster iteration of this six monthly release cycle that we have now. Um, please do ask your questions to Mala in the chat. Uh, the moderators are incredibly efficient, but if there are any left, I will put them to Mala or just put them to Mala anyway. Um, Fun fact about Mala, and I'm going to pronounce this wrong, so I'm just warning you. Um, she enjoys helping her daughter in making paper jewellery with paper. Is it quilling, Mala? Is that how you say? Is it quilling? Uh, yes, that's right. Okay. That's right. And a few of them are hosted on uh, kazvakar.com. I'll, <laughs> I'll pronounce that for you. So that's kazvakar.com. So that literally translates to paper jewellery in Hindi. Kag is a short form of uh, paper. And Zaver is uh, jewelry in Hindi. So that's cardzaver.com. Cardzaver.com. Brilliant. Thank you. I'm going to go and look that up now. Well, actually, I'm not because I'm going to listen to your talk first. Uh, so let me add your screen to the stream. I finally managed to master that sentence. And um, best of luck, Mala. Enjoy yourself. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. So let's get started. So today, um, I'll not just talk about the latest Java language features, but also how IntelliJ IDEA helps you to stay on top of them. And if you have already listened to some of my talks, which I have been doing recently this year, last year, uh, this is not an identical talk because there I have been talking only about uh, the new language features, how you can use them, why you need them. Um, but today, I would also focus on how IntelliJ IDEA helps you to uh, use them with a lot of ease. So to add, uh, thank you, Helen. That was uh, a wonderful introduction. To add just a bit to that, uh, I'm a Java champion, and I've also written a couple of books on Java certification because I strongly believe that trying Java certification can take your Java skills to the next level. A lot of Java's in that sentence. Um, and just in case, if you are not already aware, last year, Oracle released a new certification exam. Now you have to write just one exam to become certified Oracle professional. So what can you expect in this talk? I will be talking about the, the release cadence of Java and IntelliJ IDEA, as Helen mentioned, and how that impacts, how IntelliJ IDEA helps you to get to work with the latest Java language features. Um, I would also talk about the changes in the recent version of IntelliJ IDEA that really makes it simple for you to configure it to work with the new Java versions, including downloading and configuring it. Um, of course, I would talk about uh, some of the latest language features like seal types, pattern matching, for instance, of records and others as the time permits. And while I do all of this, I would also mention how the context-aware actions and inspections in IntelliJ IDEA, which is a great uh, deal of it, really helps you to work with the new language feature. So now let me talk about the release cadence of Java. Java has a six-month release cadence. Java 16 would be released in March this year. And after a gap of six months, we would see Java 17 in September this year. IntelliJ IDEA has a four month release cadence. So we see the next version 2021.1. 20, That's a bit of a tongue twister, which would be released in March this year. The second version would be in July tentatively uh, in 2021. The version number is 2021.2. 20, I would not say the version number again. 
And the third one is in November, scheduled to be released in November. So how does the release cadence of both these help uh, in you getting to work with the latest Java language features? Um, the other interesting part is the ram down phase two of Java happens a bit earlier before it is it goes GA, which is general availability. So March, 6, uh, March 16th, yes, Java 16th would be released, but the features are frozen, uh, of course, a bit earlier. So that happens around January. And that's the time when the early access version of IntelliJ IDEA is also released. So by the time you can access uh, the early access builds with the feature freeze, so that really means that no more features are going to be added to Java 16. You can also access a version of IntelliJ IDEA that has those features. Of course, it's not just the uh, highlighting of the syntax, but it also the additions of the context aware action and inspections that really help you to work with the new language features. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I would cover um, how, how that works. Um, okay, so one, um, a fact here is uh, the Java team leads, which uh, Tagir and Anna, they also work with the Amber expert group, and they really talk about the new features as they come in, how that would be implemented in IntelliJ IDEA. So there's a lot of back and forth discussion going on. So it's not just us just consuming what uh, Java has, but it's, it's a two-way communication, and that really helps because uh, to adopt any new features in Java, tooling is very important. Uh, if I'm a Java developer, I'm using IntelliJ IDEA, and if I get to use the new features without a lot of hassle, and I could just uh, use additional features in my existing IDE, and the IDE is always up to date with the new language features, what more can I ask for? So that's the magic of IntelliJ IDEA. And I've also been uh, interviewing a lot of developers uh, for the 20th anniversary of uh, IntelliJ IDEA. And a lot of them were really happy with how IntelliJ IDEA supports the latest Java language feature. So uh, now let me talk about some simple configuration uh, and how IDEA helps there. So the features that I've mentioned, like seed classes, that is a preview language feature. Uh, what a preview language feature essentially means is uh, it's a complete feature. It's not an incomplete or half-baked feature. But since Java shifted to a six-month release cadence, they did not have a lot of time to try out a feature before that would be added to the Java uh, language, because unlike an API, which can be deprecated or probably taken off in future, a language feature, once it goes into the language, it stays there forever. Of course, talking with the all other existing features uh, that we have. So a feature remains as a preview language feature when it is introduced, like the seed classes uh, and interfaces now is in its second preview in Java 16. And how do you work with those preview language feature? You need to have a, a pass value like this, enable preview, so that you know you are you know that you are using a preview language feature and you are not using it uh, by default. So this is uh, another kind of uh, I would say to help you to not use the preview language to not really prevent you from using the preview language features but to make sure you are using them and uh, that doesn't really go into your production without you knowing it. Uh, but of course, when you're working with the, the command line, you need to pass these uh, parameters and the values uh, to, uh, to compile your Java code, which uses the uh, preview language feature and also to run that. But when you are using your IDE, these simple configuration things are taken care of. But how do you take care of the production part? Of course, you have to set the uh, values when you are working with your IDE. So let me quickly hop on to my um, IDE, which is, of course, IntelliJ IDEA, and show how you can even download uh, the JDK and configure it. Because um, 
I, I remember as a developer, I used to kind of struggle if I had to download the JDK using a different tool or a website and then configure it using some uh, um, environment variables. So that I would say is not a very long process, but when you have to context switch from what you're doing and then you have to figure out a lot of things, as developers, we understand that seemingly simple things might not be simple. So let's see how uh, IntelliJ IDEA can help you there. So, um, so I can go to the project settings and when I click on uh, add new SDK button, the IDE can detect the, uh, the JDK versions which are already installed on my system, but I can also download. As of now, you will not see version 16 here because uh, Java 16 goes uh, GA next month and post that you would be able to see that. Now you can see the versions that you can download from uh, IntelliJ IDEA and also the vendors. You can choose both the versions and uh, the vendors, of course, the location. And once you install that, you would be able to, uh, I would not go ahead and uh, with the installation because that might take some time. So you can install it. And once you do that, the number of the JDK you just installed would appear here. And then you could use it to configure um, to use in your project. So this is simple. And the other one is once you have downloaded the required JDK, you can set your project SDK. So in this case, I am using 16. So you have to set it twice. So this is the project SDK, which is 16. This is taken by default, but just keep uh, make sure that uh, you are using the right uh, language level because I could be using JDK 16, but I could work with the other language levels as well. That really depends on the project that you're working with. So you could switch the language level to let's say eight, and then you would not be able to use the new language features, even though the JDK is uh, uh, a newer version. And I have worked with that, and I think that's really amazing. It has been really helpful to me. Uh, now, this, again, this feature, I really find very helpful when I'm working with the new language feature. It says I could use language level 16, and I could use the preview language feature, which is the seal types. I could use the version 16, but not use the preview language feature, and I could just use records, pattern matching, local enums, and interfaces, which are as a standard language feature in Java 16. Uh, again, so different versions, you can check out which ones do you want to use and which new versions have gone in those, uh, have added uh, in those version. Um, just in case, if you are wondering what happened to the switch expressions, which were introduced in Java 12, because now it says no new language features. So when we were talking about how the preview language features, they can change before they are finally added to the Java language. So uh, switch expressions was introduced as a preview language feature in Java 12, but after, um, I think that was two iterations, it was added as a standard language feature in Java 14. So that's why you see, the language version as 14 and switch expressions, but no new language features for Java version 12, because uh, it doesn't really make sense to support the preview language version that was released in 12, because uh, it changed in 13 and then in 14. I remember, um, I think break was initially used to return the value from one of uh, the branches that it had, but you do uh, a lot of feedback from the developers that it is kind of confusing that was changed to yield, which is Y I E L D. I'm not sure whether the pronunciation was that could be kind of understood. So that's why I spelled it out. So this is how you get to know what features are going in in each of the Java versions. So you really don't have to open another window to find out. And this I I I have been found I find that really helpful. So 
We talked about uh, the configuration, the runtime. Of course, uh, uh, you don't need to add any command line uh, parameters or uh, values it to work with the, the preview language feature. You just have to select this one, as I said. So I will keep the language level to 16 for this presentation. OK, so now let me go back to my presentation. OK, so now let me talk about the C types, which has introduced, which has, which was introduced as a preview language feature in Java 15, but it continues in its second preview in Java 16. Uh, so what this feature, uh, feature is, why do you need it, and how IntelliJ IDEA can help you to use that. So the syntax of this feature would, so let's kind of look at the literal uh, word that we have, sealed types. When I talk about sealing, I talk about uh, protecting something. I talk about sealing so that it's not used by anyone, or probably I'm talking about restricted usage of anything. So that's exactly what the seal types is. The syntax lets you uh, uh, define or restrict what are the classes or interfaces can extend your classes or interfaces. But why do you want to do that? Uh, again, as I said, because we are talking about sealing, we're talking about securing it. So the goal is to let developers create hierarchies in a declarative manner, which are secure. If you think that was quite a loaded sentence, let's see. Let's talk about an example in how we can do that. So let's talk about an example, which let's say an example for gardeners, which uh, uh, gives them information about a particular type of particular hierarchy of plants. So we are talking about, let's say, climbers, herbs, and shrubs. And we are not talking about things like aquatic plants or, or desert plants or those kind of plants, which um, so that's that's the business model that I have. So let me uh, create a new uh, class plant, which I would use to create my seal types. So let me quickly create a class. Let me say the name of the class is plant. And in this class, let me have a hierarchy of other plants. So I have a couple of other uh, types of plants. I have the herb with extent plants, shrub, climber, cucumber, a couple of uh, uh, classes that extends class plant. And how do you want to use this hierarchy? So let me go on to my project window and find the class where I should be using it. Yes. So imagine this is the method that we are talking about. And uh, uh, I assume that I have a method, which is process type, which accepts a method parameter of type plant. So how would I want to process this uh, method parameter? Let's say I say, um, what would that what should do? Okay, if plant is an instance of, let's say, herb, I want to uh, herb, sell the herb, then I say else if plant is an instance of what else do we have? We have the shrub. And what I want to do for the shrub, I want to prune the shrub. OK, so that looks good. What happens if I say the plant is an instance of, I know it's getting quite repetitive, but we'll get to the end soon. Uh, so what was the hierarchy here? OK, now let me talk about the climber first. Climber, what I want to do is I want to select say so the climber. And the last one is if the plant is an instance of uh, cucumber, what do I want to do not next? I want to harvest the cucumber. 
But if you, um, as you have been working with the if statement, you know that you need an else part here because the uh, compiler is unsure whether there would be any other type of plant that would come in as a value to this method. So we would need a final else clause. And what do we usually do as developers? So that's my favorite part. So we just print the method, we say, uh, can never read here, right? How many of you do that? And then what do we say? We say return some random value, which is zero, minus one, or one, or I don't know, what's, what's your favorite value that you return? So this is how um, we say that it would work, but this is the part that we don't really want to use because now we, are not secu uh, securing the kind of values that can be passed to plant. We still have the um, uncertainty. And this is not how I want to model my domain. I want it to be definitive. I'm not looking for extending the class plant for my uh, uh, business model. I'm looking for uh, completeness, exhaustiveness, and security. I, I just want my... Uh, uh, application to work in a certain way. I'm not really looking for extensibility. So what can we do now? So this is, again, my favorite part. You could invoke, now I'm going to seal this class. And one of the ways is I could write the terms because I already know them. The other one is I could invoke context-aware actions in IntelliJ IDEA which is by using alt and enter. You would see the shortcuts that I would be using uh, for my presentation towards the bottom of the screen. So uh, I'm not sure whether you would be able to see that. So I, I just flashed towards the bottom. I might not mention them uh, as they flash, but this is how uh, you would get to know the shortcuts that I would be using in the presentation. So when I say alt and enter on my plant, I get an option of seal class. So as I mentioned initially, how IntelliJ IDEA helps you to work with the latest Java language features, even though you might not know all the tiny details about them. So this is one of the ways, invoking the context-aware actions. So in this case, I click on seal class, and this adds this keyword to the class plant. And automatically, all the subclasses here, they are defined as non-sealed. But this is uh, not really the case. The subclasses could be either uh, final, they could be non-sealed, or they could be sealed. So what happens if I delete the non-sealed part? So I see that herb is underlined with the red uh, wavy line here. And what does that mean? So I can invoke. Uh, uh, I can navigate to the next error by F2, and I also see a message which is quite, uh, I would say, explicit in what it wants me to do. It says sealed, non-sealed, or final modifiers expected. And this is the message that I see on invocation of F2. I, again, I can use context-aware actions, which is uh, alt and enter. And I get the options of making herb final. So let me choose that. Now, I don't want to, um, I, I want the class shrub to be non-sealed. Let's see what options do I have if I remove the non-sealed part from the climb class. Now, again, I get to see the same message. When I select alt and enter, I make it a sealed class. Now, what happens? Now. This is underlined. See, let's see what happens here. So if I seal the derived class climber, I need to define uh, its subclasses as either again seal, non-seal, or final. Let me just make this one final. Right. And uh, one other thing, since this class, all, all the classes are in the same source file. I don't really need the permits clause towards the end of uh, the declaration of my class plant. But if you are, if you define all these classes in separate source files, then you would need that. So I'm 
adding this here but if you would have as i said all these files in different source files then IntelliJ would prompt you to do that so here by the permits clause i can actually define which other classes can extend class plant now how uh, can i do that and how can i use it use it so as of now um, as i said initially the seed classes let you uh, define a secure hierarchy in a declarative manner. So now you can declare which other classes can extend your class plant. And um, um, you are uh, uh, decoupling the accessibility from extensibility. Now, if a class plant is accessible to another class, let's say, I don't know, aquatic plant, it can still access it, but it cannot extended so you are adding uh, a lot of uh, uh, security here now let me go back to my class and so this is how so as of now we can't really do much about this if else statement because that's how the syntax of the java language is uh, as of now the seal types can only prevent the extension of your class and you can really define uh, who can extend it by the permits clause. But in a future version, this might happen. Uh, work on pattern matching is in progress at Oracle and it's being extended to the switch expressions as well. So in a future version, you might see something like this, where you would be able to iterate on the types of a, of a base class and then uh, return a value. The same way you can iterate on, uh, let's say, the values of an enum, because that's an exhaustive list. So when we have the exhaustive list for the types that extend a base class, then we would be able to use it in pattern matching, for instance, of. Um, uh, recently, I think some text was published on this by Brian Gates. So I recommend that you check out that one. I'm, I don't know. I'm not sure whether I have the link in my presentation, but that's an interesting read. I think we can see that as a preview language feature in Java 17. Who knows? So, so this is how this is what I have about sealed types. And yes, one other thing. So I was talking about the sealed classes in the same way you can also seal your interfaces. In this case, move is an interface which is sealed and it permits other classes and interfaces which can extend or uh, implement it. So the same way you can also seal your interfaces as well. Um, the benefits are the same as the sealed classes as we talked, as I mentioned. So let me hop on and let me see, uh, okay, we already had the demo. Now we, let me talk about the pattern matching for instance of, this has been added as a standard language feature in Java 16. So let's see what do we have uh, here. So this is records and this is seal types. Okay, so we are classes. Okay, so we have the pattern matching, right. So uh, what is this feature about? So let's see if we, uh, so let's first talk about how we have been using instance of operator until now before this feature was introduced. Let's say I have a method which is output value in uppercase and I pass this uh, an object of type, a parameter of type object. So what I can say here is I can check if the value that I pass to this method is of type string. And depending on if it is, I could print the value in uppercase. So what I say here is if object is an instance of, let's say, string, then what do I want to do? Um, I would create, um, um, let's say, the, uh, let me create a local variable. I say string string is equal to obj dot first. Right. And I'm casting it. So this is quite slow. Uh, so what I just did is I'm creating a local variable and I'm casting 
uh, obj to string what is the next obvious thing i just want to output the value i say two uppercase so this looks simple but what is the problem here i have an obvious uh, repetition and uh, declaration of uh, a variable which i don't think it's required what do you want to do after you compare whether a value is of certain type of course you would try to extract uh, or access a member from that uh, object so when you talk about the repetition or things which seem implicit of course we can have an area of improvement there and this is exactly what pattern matching for instance of does now how does intellij idea help you to work with it if you notice the variable str has a different background it has a yellow background which highlights that there are improvements that can be applied to it so and how do i access those improvements again alt and enter is your friend when you're working with intellij idea so if you can kind of take away just one tip from the session that would be of using alt and enter much often uh, when you work with it because it can offer you a lot of suggestions when uh, in your ide highlights some code or even if it's not highlighting the code as we saw in terms of the seal classes so let me invoke a uh, context aware action and i can replace str with a pattern variable so let me do that so this is the pattern variable which is a local variable which is declared here and initialized with the casted value of of, of uh, the value which is passed here the obj and uh, so there's been change earlier i could not uh, uh modify the value of this variable but in java 16 that's allowed so i could modify this value in here if i want to but uh, let's not do that because that's not required now what happens if i try to access this variable this pattern variable here let's say i say if this is not um uh dot to upper case so let's say i want to do this no what did i just do okay so what what just happened here if i click on f2 it says i cannot resolve the symbol str in the else block so the scope of the local variable is uh, of the pattern variable which is str is restricted to the if part here and what can i do here so of course uh, if i say alt and enter it prompts me um, the idea prompts me to create either a field or uh, a parameter str so i i have multiple ways to work and this really helps me to understand that this is not available in the else block and what else can i do so i so that's a um, uh, double benefit i would say this doesn't work why it doesn't work and how can i get around this or do i want to get around this so uh yes this is okay so let me kind of just get rid of this one um so we just talked about the scope of pattern variable and that it's no longer a final variable in java 16 what else can i show you of course let me hop on to my project window and oh my god i already have the simplified version i do not have the other version which i show so let me hop on the other one okay so in this one what i always show is that i have a long equals method where i have uh, values matching um not sure whether i would be able to replicate that so that's okay uh let me hop on to the other class which is project and let's see how intellij idea can help you make your code concise by offering the suggestions again using the context aware actions 
and inspections. So now we all are we also talking about the inspections that we have in IntelliJ IDEA. So first of all, I see that this uh, this is highlighted in yellow. So let me invoke the context action and I want to replace this with a pattern variable. So I did that. Now, can you see two if statements here? So I have if and another if, and this is yet another if. So what I want to do is I want to, again, I invoke context actions using alt and enter. And the suggestion that I get is I can merge the nested if statements. And how do I know that I can see uh, that this suggestion exists? I would show that to you uh, a bit later after I talk about the another Java language feature, new language feature, which is records. And I'll talk about the settings where you can access uh, these uh, intentions and inspections. Or I can do that right after I simplify this method. So in this case, I would merge the nested statements here. And I see that I have another set of nested if statements right up one after the other and I could merge this as well. Now as soon as I do that I see that this the background changes to yellow and now I know IDE my IDE has another suggestion for me here. So let's see what the suggestion is. So this is replace the loop with collection dot remove if so uh uh, I'm not sure whether you read the description of uh, this talk, but I also talked about how IntelliJ IDEA can help you to work with a certain language version of Java. So it's not just about the new language versions that come out in 16, 15, or 14. If you are, let's say, working with uh, Java 8 or Java 9, and you are using, uh, let's say, some uh, ways of working, like using uh, your external loops, you can have IntelliJ IDEA suggest you that you can use a different way to achieve the same result. Let's say if I'm using an explicit loop, I could use uh, a method from the Java API. I think I'm going in different direction now and let me talk about uh, simplifying this method. So I'll uh, select replace the loop with collection dot removeif and what I get now is I can also inline this variable. And this is how this method has been made concise. So let me, I think I messed up with my settings of uh, how to format the code, so which is okay, probably I'll fix that later. But this is how I could make my code concise by uh, using the context aware actions and inspections in, uh, in, in IntelliJ IDEA. So uh, let me go on. And yes, the other part of uh, this new language feature, which is Pattern matching, for instance, of is when you first read about this feature, you might say, oh, it lets me just kind of get rid of one line, which is the casting of uh, a variable into another type. And I think I can do without it. But no, that's not really the case. How this feature works with the other part of your code and how you could use uh, it in um, a uh, combination with the other features that your IDE has, or once you use that feature, that could open you a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, opportunities. Because in this case, when we got rid of one of the line, which was casting in uh, by a local variable to a particular type, I could actually merge the nested ifs, and then I could use a particular API call and inline uh, a variable and that really made my code consign. So this is not just about losing one line of code, but it's how you make it work with the rest of your code. 
And the code that you see now, I think that's concise and it's easy to read. It's not terse, so that really helps. So now let me go on to the next uh, feature, which is records. So again, this was kind of voted by as one of the best and favorite features by a lot of developers when we had um, a poll last time when Java 15 was released, or was it 14? I don't remember, but it was certainly voted as one of the favorite features by a lot of Java developers. And I have an example for you to uh, kind of help you understand why is it so. Imagine you walk into a, a shop and you want to shop trousers for yourself. And what you see is all the trousers are of the same size and length. What do you do? Of course, you have to pick any one of them because they are of the same size. But depending on your size, they could be big, tight, or small. And of course, if you are lucky enough, that could fit perfectly. So this is what, as Java developers, we have been doing using the same class, altering it, and using it for different purposes. And one of that purpose was to define the data classes or the wrapper of just a set of values. So what did we uh, do? We defined a class. We had fields to store the values, getters, setters, constructors, hash code, equals, to string, a lot of other methods to make the class really work. That's no longer required if you work with records. So records define a compact way of defining your class as data. So let's see, let's see how that works. So let me hop on to my editor. Let's see, we had some, mm -mm -mm. yes. So I have this class in which I have this line of code and I have not defined uh, this class person. And the purpose of class person would be to store and retrieve details of a person, let's say the name and the age, to a file and then read from file. So what can I do? So because this is not defined, so that's why it's in the red color. And let's see how my um, IDE can help me here. So when I say Alt and Enter, I get the suggestions. I can create this type as a class person. I can also create this as an enum or a record. Um, I want to show you some other features of IntelliJ IDEA. So let me uh, select creating this class as a uh, this as a class and not a record. So I say I want to create this class. And what do I want to do? Let me say I want the fields as let me mark them final and also private string name happening private final string name what is the problem variable name okay so that would be solved when we have uh, the constructor so let's private final int and age and now i want to insert constructor and this looks good. I also want to insert the getter methods for it. Perfect. What do I have? I also want, so I'm using the generate feature of IntelliJ IDEA to generate the constructors and add the other methods that, uh, as I mentioned, as developers, we are used to adding to a class so that we can use it uh, and store its instances in the collection uh, in collection classes because if we don't add equals in hash code and uh, the uh, methods then that really will not work mess up with how you store and retrieve your values in collection classes so let me add the equals in hash code method here and yes are almost and now I want to add the equals to string method as well. So this is how as developers we are kind of used to uh, defining our data classes, but not anymore.
let me hop back here and see if this would work now because i'm storing and retrieving details of a person to and from a text file let me also uh, what i want to do is implement the serializable interface serializable interface right and now let me run this to see if this is working fine i hope it does and we don't have any um, errors yes seems to work fine because we did not get to see any errors now i think my assistant is running something in and why is it taking so much of time okay yes I, I I think I'm having some issues with, okay, no, didn't work, okay, because I have some, oh, just a moment, okay, let me get rid of this one, okay, I have something here, which I know I was looking for something where I could just run one class and um, kind of mess that one. So let's see if I can run this now. And yes, looks good. Yes, and yes, right? Oh my God, yes. Yes, now we have the result and um, I could actually read and uh, write this person to a file and then read from it. We are running out of time. Now let me go back and I just want to delete this from there. Let's say delete, I guess. Now what happens? I want to go back here and I want to say that I want to create this as a record. As I said, I can just invoke uh, context actions and I can create this as a record. And I can say string name and int age. Let me implement the serializable interface because I want it to read and write it from C. Why did I get the spelling wrong? <laughs> I know that that's what happens when you life code. Okay, so, um, so this is just one line of code which would do all the work that the other class was doing, which we just created. And let's see if we can read and write this to the file and from the file. This looks good. Okay, yes, we'll get there. I don't have to worry. I should not worry. Yes, so this is working. And so what did we see here? We got the same amount of work done by just one single line of code and by not creating a full blown class. So that's interesting. Now, the other interesting part, which is, of course, by IntelliJ IDEA. Now, when I say Alt and Insert, I, the IDE asks, what kind of constructor do you want to generate for this record, which is different to the rec uh, constructor which we create for a regular class. So let me say I want to create uh, a compact constructor, which, as you can see, doesn't has the parameters which are passed to it. Um, 12 minutes to left. Ellen, I'm doing that fast. I'll try to do that fast. Okay, so what can I do here? Of course, like a regular constructor, you can check whether uh, the value that is being passed to it are the right ones that you expect. Otherwise, you can say throw um, illegal argument exception and what what's the age is less than zero. So this is how I could define a compact constructor inside my record class. And uh, the IDE would really help me to insert the right constructor in the right uh, place. 
Uh, what other things can I show you about the records? Let me go back to my thing. OK, so did you notice here that the way you use a record to instantiate it, it's absolutely the same how you would instantiate a, a regular class. So this is nice. The other thing that I want to show is adding the fields and the methods. Um, I cannot add, uh, let's say, another field to it. I can't say this because it doesn't make sense to have a record define its state by the components it has, the way the components are defined for this record, and then kind of say that I want to add another field. No, that's not how it works. You are completely kind of uh, destroying the purpose. But of course, you can define the static uh, uh, fields, uh, static variables in a, in a record. And you could define instance uh, methods, and you can also define, let me, do we have the time? Yes, another, Helen, probably only five more minutes. So yes, uh, you can define a, a instance uh, method and static methods. So let's hop on and see what other things you have. The, the base class of a record is by default java.lang.record. So you can't really extend any other uh, uh, class or record from your record. And the other interesting thing in Java 16 with records is that it's truly immutable. You cannot change it even using reflection. I know as developers, you are kind of using the reflection to change the final fields of uh, your objects. You cannot do that with records. Let me show that. I had some, uh, OK, so so I have this code here. Let me kind of get rid of uh, this window. So this is uh, the method change final field values for non-records where I have uh, this class, which is um, just, OK, what am I doing wrong here? OK, so this is, um, so notebook is just a regular class, and it's not a record. And point is a record. And when I run, <coughs> sorry. When I run this class, you would see that. So let me just kind of walk you through the code. Here I'm trying to create a variable of notebook, which is not a record. And I initialize a value for the instance field that it has. And then using reflection, I change the value. And when I execute this line, the reflected, the change value would reflect here. But point is uh, a record, as you can see here. And when I try to modify the instance value, the fields of uh, this instance using reflection, that doesn't work. So let me run this and see how this works. Another seven minutes to go. Um, Right, so probably there's just one feature that I would show right after I demonstrate this one. Yes, so if you can see, you can modify the final fields of a regular, a regular class using reflection, but not for a record. So this is interesting. You can finally have immutable data if you use records. So what other things do I have? Um, it's just about uh, the generic records. So I will take just one minute to kind of create that one. So can you define um, records which take generics? Yes, you can. Let me define the record name as parcel. And let me define the type parameter as T. Let me quickly define a class which is table, which is just a dummy class, which I would probably use it here. And what I want is, oh, no, I did not want to, to create this as 
a regular class. I want to create this as um, a record. So I need to select record here and then I would say parcel. So when I use IntelliJ IDEA and I want to say I want to create a new type, I get the option of record. So here I would say add a type parameter here and then I would say contents and then I have double weight. Right, and let me kind of uh, just create a dummy class, which is class table. So this is it. And when I, how would you instantiate this one? Let me say parcel, and then I say table, and okay, let's do new parcel and the value that i pass is new table and some random value let's say this so this is how i can create uh, records that use annotation and i can also add the um not null annotation to it so add annotations to class part. so this is again another feature that i really love so Annotation was not available, but my IDE could figure it out and add it. So that's how. Oh, I missed this one. How could I? So this is in inspections. You've got about 30 seconds, Mala. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I'll take one minute. <laughs> 45 seconds. Go. Okay. So you can um, access the project settings and then you can view the different inspections which are available in uh, your IDE. Uh, if you look for control flow, I just used uh, the merging of the if statements. And you can also look for intentions and that would show you uh, the list of intentions that are available for uh, your code in your IDE. And the other interesting part is, OK, so you can also modify. What was that? That was inspections. OK, so you can have the list of inspections and intentions in your code using the settings. And you can also modify the background color that you have when uh, it notifies you of the changes that you can make. So that was it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mala. Thank you. That was that was really informative. Um, we do we do have some questions. The moderators have again been very good and very efficient. So thank you for that. Um, we do have three minutes before the next talk. So um, if anybody needs to make a coffee, etc., now is a great time to do it. Um, there was firstly, Mala. I loved your talk. It was awesome. I love your code samples. They're very clean. They're very clear, and they're very relatable as well. You know, it's not foo and bar, it's plants. I love plants. Um, uh, one, one question was, how do you do those nicely formatted comments? I think I've seen this question at least twice already today. So um, if you could explain those in 30 seconds. <laughs> so that's the in doc rendering. OK, so did I add something? OK, I have to move this one back again. Um, so, the, so that's feature, the, in, the, uh, not a very recent one. I think that was added in 2020.2 or 3. Okay. But now you can, uh, this is how you can render your comments. So I would also upload uh, this code to GitHub. And when people uh, download that, they could would be actually be able to see um, how that looks. Brilliant. Thank you very much.